By the end of that work, we had discovered over two then small trips, 1,550 individual hominid remains, leaving thousands of them still in this chamber. All of that discovery recovered from sweeping the floor so we wouldn't step on the material and doing a, an 80 centimeter by 40 centi 30 centimeter excavation. It would represent ultimately 15 individuals. We needed a way, though, to describe this unprecedented amount of material. Let me give you an idea of what that number means. That is more individually numbered hominid remains than been discovered in all of southern Africa in the previous 90 years since a Tong child was discovered. And so we decided to put together a team to, descri to describe this remarkable assemblage. Not only the existing Sadiba team of scientists who were probably some of the best prepared to study this remarkable material, but we also put a call out to early career scientists who had current data sets and current state-of-the-art technology because we couldn't do this abundance without that. So we brought people in the early stages of their career together here at a workshop I'm very proud to say was funded by the National Science Foundation of South Africa, the NRF. We brought 36 early career scientists and more than a dozen experienced scientists together in a workshop in May of 2014 to analyze this beautiful material. The most complete foot ever discovered. There, in fact, are six of them in that assemblage. Incredible, complete hands like we've never seen before. Some of you, I hope, went to Maripang along with 55,000 other people to see some of the that's about 25% that's about of the total number of fossils that actually came out that we had on display there. We eventually decided to publish in the open access journal eLife. The two papers that you saw come out just eight weeks and a day ago uh, on a new species that we called Homo naledi. We described it as the remarkable creature it is, a tiny brain, but the shape of the brain being very interesting and derived, tiny human-like teeth that are primitive in their pattern and morphology, yet simplified in their cuspal patternings, ape-like shoulders, human-length arms, human wrist, human length and proportioned hand, but then the most primitive curvature of fingers that we've ever seen in any hominids, except for the most primitive, five million year old hominids like already Pithecus, on top of a chest that shaped like an ape that turns into something not like an ape, like an Australopithecine with a flat primitive pelvis and primitive Australopith-like femurs and long human-like legs with a human foot on the end of it. A bizarre combination. Just to give you an idea of the tiny orange-sized brain, 450 to 550 cubic centimeters, that's it compared to a human in the background. Extraordinarily small. It is not a human. You would not mistake it for one. That's Lucy on the left. There's the Turconoboy, a Homo erectus in the middle, which you could mistake for a human. And there is Homo naledi on the right. And yes, the joke pinhead has occurred to people and other things. They are not pathological. They're all remarkably consistent. In fact, the 15 individuals that we have so far are all almost identical to each other. They vary less than any human population we've ever me uh, measured. It's incredible, the lack of diversity in the species homogeneity. And that probably speaks to things like relatedness. We now know more about this species of hominid two years after its discovery than almost any other species ever discovered in the history of the science of the search for ancient human relatives. Because we have so much. Everything from fetuses, our fetal-aged individuals, to children, to tweens, to teens, to young adults, to adults, to the extreme elderly who've worn their teeth right down to the dentine. That alone would have been an extraordinary discovery. We would have been very grateful for that as a team, I assure you. 
Our team had won the lottery twice. But that, of course, wasn't the whole story. The context was perhaps even more extraordinary. We knew from about day seven that this was an unbelievable situation. By day seven, I remember stopping Marina Elliott, one of the young women scientists, and I said, are you cherry-picking the material from down in that cave? Because as she opened up the latest bag to come up with material in it, it was nothing but hominids. We had not seen any other animals but one species. The first day we'd found a modern owl leg. Poor thing, it somehow got in there. Over the course of the entire expedition, we would find six or so isolated rat incisors and nothing else but hominids. Most of the senior people on our team are all people like me. We've trained in anatomy, forensics, pathology, archaeology, and such. We have a great knowledge of paleontological record. You will have heard of monospecific assemblages before, one species assemblages. They are, though, almost unknown in the entire paleontological record of planet Earth particularly amongst vertebrates, and particularly amongst terrestrial vertebrates. When you hear of a monospecific assemblage, a wildebeest kill in a, in a river crossing, or a mammoth kill site, or a horse site, or something like that, almost always it isn't a monospecific assemblage. It's got other things mixed in it, because it's captured in an environment that already is collecting material, the things that die in the river before, the things that live in the environments, and afterwards are other animals caught up in that. In fact, they're almost unknown in the entire history of the entire paleontological record. Well, except for if you study archaeology. There is one species where you find one species species all the time in assemblages, modern humans. But that is, in fact, a factor, even then, of generally the last 10,000 years or so where you have completely modern humans burying their dead in mass graves and such as that. So we began to try to eliminate other things. We could eliminate that this was a predator assemblage. There was no predatory damage. There was no scavenging damage. These individuals had not washed into this cave. You could tell that from the sediments. There was no sorting of the sediments. That sediment's not been inundated. There are even um, uh, angular clay particles in it. It has not been a product of water. All the material in the cave is originated from within that chamber itself. We knew that this was not a mass death scenario. The individuals, we could tell by their taphonomy and position and the way they were laid out, they'd come in one at a time. One by one by one, over time. We didn't know how long, but they were not all in there together. And after eliminating all of the probable things, among others, we came to the remarkable, if not controversial, hypothesis that this is likely a deliberate body disposal site by a non-human species of animal, the first discovered in all of history. We just met practically an alien. It's like an old Star Trek episode. What do you do when you meet something as complex as you but different? We put that hypothesis out in the second paper that appeared eight weeks and a day ago. And it is interesting to note, and you can imagine that that is not a non-controversial thing to suggest. Because until that moment, September 10th, not only were we the only animal known in all of history to deliberately dispose of its dead in a ritualized, and by that I mean repeated fashion, it was in fact thought to identify modern humans. Perhaps almost the only thing that does. We had removed the idea that we were completely separate from nature more than 100 years ago, the discovery of fossils. We would further edged into that with the discovery that things like chimpanzees make tools and then other animals make tools 
And that even things like aesthetics and art are perhaps not unique to us in the form of birds decorating and other complex behaviors by other animals. But boy, we still had that idea of self-recognition of mortality that results in deliberate body disposal. And now we do, as a species, perhaps have to contemplate that we may not have always been alone. And I think that's a great thing for us as a species to ponder and ponder the significance of. I'm going to end there. There's a lot of research to come. You are going to see dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of papers produced on this. Already two more have been published just three weeks ago in Nature Communications. There are dozens more coming out. We are continuing research all the time. This will go on for decades or hundreds of years. What we do with that remains that are still in the chamber, we're going to enter a discourse with the entire world's community of scientists and say, well, what do we leave for future generations? Do we need more? Is this enough? Are you convinced? Or do we need to work? We are working right now, literally, teams in the field as of today, doing continuing geological, geophysical sampling. We will get an age on this deposit. And that won't be that long in the future, I assure you. And that's going to be very exciting, no matter how old they are. Because it will have dramatic effects on the field of archaeology and paleoanthropology and anthropology to understand when this species existed and what it was affecting within its environment. We are continuing to explore. I did learn my lesson from Malapa. I may be a slow learner, but I'm not a completely blind one. Our teams stay in the field now. There are explorers out there every single day underground. And I can also assure you this, as a science community, some people said Malapa was a miracle. Then some people said, well, rising star is a miracle. I can assure you they're not. This is not the last gigantic discovery that's coming out of that area. I know that for a fact. And that's a good thing. We are entering the greatest age of exploration there has ever been. Where not only do we know it's not over, that it wasn't the age of people in ships going into jungles and climbing mountains for the first time, and that the only contribution we as scientists would make would be standing on the microscopic shoulders and moving up incrementally. There are big things out there to be found. But we need to raise a generation of scientists who get out from behind their computers and use that technology to make discoveries. But it cannot be replaced without human beings going out there and doing it and believing there's more out there. This discovery, both of them, were made in the most explored area on planet Earth for those very objects. The Dinaletti chamber is 800 meters from Swartkrons, one and a half kilometers from Sturkfontein. It was right under our nose. The word hero is overused in almost every sphere. But I do not use it lightly nor wrongly in this case. These people who are becoming inspirations around the world, explorers we're now training, young South Africans. We have the first now young black South African explorers working underground with our teams. Most of these women have now joined our teams in some level or way, many of them moving back here permanently as inspirations to young women in science. That science is not for women today all about working in some laboratory for some bald white guy like me for the rest of your life with a glass ceiling clearly above your head. But it can also be at the front of exploration, in the cool stuff, doing the dangerous stuff that often women are better equipped to do than a team of men. And we should all applaud 
heroes like that who are going to be the leaders of the next generation of explorers and discoverers. Thank you very much for your time.